Today on a couple of pointers podcast, we're lucky enough to have Tim Teal from Go One. Welcome to the show. Pleasure to be on the show, Ricky. Thanks for the invitation. Right, I'm so excited to have this chat today. I've been following your content on LinkedIn, learning a hell of a lot, and I've got quite a few topics I want to dig into. Let's do it. So, mate, first of all, the hair, the surfing, right? Like, what's first, right? You, the surfing salesman? The surfing salesman, for sure, of course. The hair's only a recent COVID edition. Oh, okay. So that's a lockdown haircut. That's a COVID it's haircut. It's a lockdown haircut. But I have found a trend. The longer the hair, the more I overachieve quota. <laughs> Wow, so it's a little bit like Samson. <laughs> exactly, and there'll be an equilibrium one day where I'm going to have to start cutting it back up. Wow, wow, okay. So the Samson salesman then too, the surfing yeah. Samson. Like, yeah. I love that. Right, there's so much I want to dive into, but some of the topics you've spoken about recently, one's becoming a better sales copyright. One of the other topics I want to dive into with you is just around like mental health within sales. I want to talk about qualifications and some of the processes there and definitely one of your main topics at the moment, leading the sale. But let's start off with writing. Sure. When you started in sales, did you have any previous writing experience? Were you like a, a straight A student in English? Absolutely not. Right. Writing is easily my, the area that I need to focus on the most. So for me, it's always been back of mind, not realizing the true importance of having good copywriting skills. Have you, the market that you're selling to for Go One, is it enterprise? We vary between like SMB all the way through to, to enterprise little customers. I've sold everything from, you know, pop shop through to pretty large enterprise organizations like multinational banks, very varying sizes of businesses that we go after. Have you found that the level that you need to write at or your capability in writing needs to be different with different markets? Definitely. I think in my early days when I was in SMB, it, it didn't matter as much. But now that I'm more in that mid-market enterprise space, the way that I write an email or a business case or put together a proposal, it needs to hit the mark because I'm presenting to well-educated people in positions of power and responsibility. So that whole write an email like a six-year-old Maybe that relates to cold email, but once you get into the meat of a sale, you better write that email like a bloody professional. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still do agree though that the tenets of writing a simple or easy to read email is important regardless of the market, but I think structure is incredibly key. Having clear outcomes of an email or the next steps are, are incredibly important. Yeah, there's that famous quote and I don't remember who said it, I should look it up, but uh, there's that famous quote that uh, if I had more time, this letter would be shorter. It's incredibly difficult writing a succinct email. Yeah. Do you find that's one of the challenges is how to pack that impact in a short amount of like words, in a few words? Yeah, that quote just, yeah, it, it hit the nail on the head for me. I find sometimes I'll punch out a really long email and different sections and bolds and hyperlinks. And then I get to the end of it and go, what have I done? Like I've gone back to what I would have been doing a number of years ago, or even pre-sales and almost restart the email and again think to myself before i write the email what is the purpose of this email what is the message i'm trying to get across what are the actions i'm trying to get out of it and keeping it back to basic now does go one or do you have a specific structure that you now try to stick to no but i would be open to hearing what works for others i find that right now i'm probably more thinking consciously when i'm writing an email but still probably have a lack of lack of direction in regards to true process i'm still in my early stages of becoming a good copywriter yeah and copy really is one of the hardest skills to learn do you use any of those tools grammarly lavender i don't know what else yeah i've, I've recently tried for, for grammarly premium so go on gives us like a learning development budget so we can go out and buy newspaper subscriptions or different tool subscriptions so i've recently done grammarly and it has been very interesting to see the insights into how you can restructure or change the way a sentence is structured and so that's been really useful from more of a specific feedback back loop but as for longer structured emails again that's probably an area that i need to work on a little more I have some PTSD from Grammarly. Just, I have nightmares. Someone's saying, you're writing about this in the passive voice. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> okay, now it's assertive and aggressive. Yeah, yeah, hang on a minute, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, I'm trying my best check, Grammarly. I don't know how to change this yeah. from passive voice. Yeah. Anyway, I get that. Do you, whenever you get to that point where you've got this like massive email and you realize, fuck, I've just pushed out an essay. Do you ever flip over to video? Love video, love video. I, just before this call, I, I yeah, condensed an email into a short video and yeah. yeah i find video i believe video is incredibly engaging i can then use visual aid to assist in the message i'm trying to get across yeah. and i'd like to think that it's easy for the, for the end person to consume as well honestly it to me everyone talks about 
video in prospecting and I hate it in prospecting. I, nah. It's If I'm not going to read your email, which is going to take 30 seconds of my time, I'm not pushing into a two minute 30 video. <laughs> Fuck it, if a YouTube video hasn't caught me in seven seconds, yeah. I'm out. Like yeah. I'm not watching your prospecting video. But when I actually do want to consume the information, it is so much easier to listen to someone talk to me and explain it the way that they understand it as opposed to trying to get Grammarly to help them structure this into a concise way and those visual aids to superpower it further down the funnel. Which tool are you using? I'm a big fan of Loom. Yeah, mate, I'm a biggest fan of Loom too. It's the cheapest. It does the transcript as well, so people can yeah. read. Like it, it just post production. The, the editing's quite good as well. Yeah, absolutely. Share it off with the team, and I don't need all of that, buddy. If I open it four times, create a no. task in my CRM. Like, never used any of that. No, neither. Simple is better. And I also love how it just unfolds in Slack. Yeah. I just click play and it plays right there. So that's amazing because people talk about, as we are, email in your sales copy, but video really does fall into that category. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I find that you've got to lean on your strength. My strength is presenting, is talking. So if I can leverage video in an email, which means that I don't have to punch out a long-winded body of text, then I'm all for it. Yeah. My, what I often do, I write the email because that gives me structure of what I want to talk about as well. It's way too long. And then at the top of the email, I'll say, mate, I've written it below in case you want it, but don't bother reading it. Here it is. And okay. then I pop the video in as well, just because uh, I've already written it. I would get to the video and I realize like this should have been a video. So I just leave it all in. I guess that way people get to consume what they want. Now, when you're training up new sales reps, how do you help them with email? I'm still a huge advocate of video. I think when a new sales rep can get comfortable and recording their screen. Typically, they might start off with the camera turned off and that's okay in the early days, but having your face there is incredibly important. But getting someone comfortable with video to include in their email, they're having then multi-modalities of delivery. So now they can use hyperlinks to a video, they can use strong body and text using your tables or attachments. I think it's another media that they can leverage. Of course, it's probably more so the barrier of confidence that they have in jumping in and doing a customized video. As for emails, again, it probably varies from someone's level of copywriting skills. So of course we have sales copywriting, but there are better people in our organization with zero sales experience that could write a much better email than I can. So depending on a new sales rep, whether they are young within their career or mature and they have good copywriting skills, it's all dependent on, on their level of proficiency ultimately. And it's so important that you mentioned there's other people in the business that can write better. I always believe like writing is so important and you can't leave the success of your business to the writing ability of your most recent junior hire. If you've got marketing, you've got senior leadership, they should really help craft the messaging that your team's using. Absolutely. Do you have like templates pushed through the organization? Yeah, we have some, uh, we have a wonderful sales enablement team led by Danielle yeah. and they have some sales or enablement assets. So we have a few different varying presentations that we can leverage where there may be some pre-wording in there, but ultimately in, in sales, your copywriting is dependent based on what the prospect is sharing with you, their business challenges, the potential solution that is conveyed in their language that they're using. So a big skill of copywriting that I focus on is how can I recap what I've heard in, and condense it into a succinct formula that I can then share back with them. And for me, that is the real art of copywriting. That's pretty impressive. Do you use some conversational intelligence tools that helps to capture that? Or are you just manually note taking during a call? I still manually note take with Apple Notes. Don't yeah. diss it. Um, whatever. I'm fine with pen and paper, like whatever works. Pen and paper, yeah. Pen and paper, I think, would be probably better than Apple Notes. But we utilize Gong as our call intelligence tool, if you will. So for me, when I'm making that presentation or even writing the email afterwards, I can jump back into the call. I typically, my shortcuts is I turn myself off as a speaker because I don't need to re-listen to what I've said. And I'll simply listen to the words the prospect has used throughout and try and use that language in my email or in the pre presentation that I'm putting together. That's amazing. Like clever, clever use of those tools. I find most of those tools are very expensive, fancy call recorders. And the use case that you've just spoken about is one of the great ones. Go back, review your meeting, pull out some language. I also like to get their tonality, but right? nothing worse than when you bang out this massive email and they write back with three lines. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, let's talk on Tuesday. <laughs> You're like, yeah. well, okay. Probably they weren't that interested in reading it all. Yeah. Amazing. There's so many golden nuggets there that I could take out of it. And if I was to summarize, it's just like practice that, that writing. It's actually one of the few skills I do try higher for. I'll teach an SDR to do 
anything. But teaching someone to write well is very challenging when you're ramping up an SDR because there's so many skills to learn. Like in a year, you have to go from zero to genuinely hero. There's so much to learn to be an SDR. And writing is one of the things that I just find takes time. I'm married Sorry. I'm married in for it, by the way. I was so bad of a copywriter that my wife's a copywriter. One of the, one of the skills I was like, no, almost like Game of Thrones, right? We're going to have to merge the bloodlines. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, with you. I'm with you there not so much with my partner but my brother is an amazing he's a published online author i wish i had some of that skill but absolutely not amazing now moving from that writing to leading the sale because the those two are intertwined yeah. right what are some of the tips that you have for how an account executive can lead the sale. So I think um, the biggest part of the sales process that I'm most passionate about, and I appreciate it's probably overkill, is the discovery. The discovery is where you are able to dig in for all the information that you need to ultimately start to lead the sale. Without a good solid discovery, I believe, you won't ever be able to lead the sale, even if they have strong interest and you're near the end of the sales process because you're leading that sale blindly. And I think coming back to trying to understand the information around the decision-making process and understanding if you've got that process and it's validated and you think it's credible, or even if you think you've got a rough process and you're not sure it still needs some validation. Because I believe that once you go through and you do a product demonstration, if you're gonna go through a trial, if you're then gonna start pulling in multiple stakeholders to then drive a business case or take to the execs, you need to know those stages which ultimately form what the next step is going to be at each stage of the cycle. I think a really big overwhelming terminology we use is a mutual close plan. I just, I when I hear those words, I feel like it's a shared document and you expect the prospects to go in there and to type away with you and I just don't think that happens that often. But when we're talking about leading the sale, it's ultimately like a mutual close plan when the prospect doesn't even know it. We know what the next step is. You've got it mapped out yourself already. There is a close plan in place. It's just, we're not using that fancy terminology, which can often be a little bit daunting. I know it feels daunting yeah. for myself. Those mutual close plans, mutual action plans, I think the new term that people are starting to use is mutual or joint impact plan or mutual impact, yeah. like every, all of these terms. But I love what you're saying there about leading the, you don't often get your clients to engage on those mutual action plans. Maybe it's more prevalent in enterprise sales where there's yeah. buying committees, yeah. where there's a lot of stakeholders and by putting it in front of them saying, look, all right, we definitely want to get some input from finance. Let's make that part of it. And we as the seller and you as the buyer or as the champion within the buying team, we're going to work together to go approach finance to get their input. And then we need to look at how it's going to integrate from an IT perspective, whatever it might be. Complex sales, year-long sales cycles, love a mutual action plan. But yeah, being able to lead it, you mentioned the discovery being the most important thing. I am such a firm believer that the discovery process is the sales process. If you do a good discovery, all the rest is just facilitating the deal. All of it. Real key good discovery is where they realize their gaps, their challenges. You've helped them uncover that. Maybe they weren't clear in their head and you have all the ammunition you need to be able to decide if you are able to help them or not. What framework do you use for discovery? Uh, I've probably formed a bit of a combination of my own. So yeah. of course you've got the classics like Band, Medic. Uh, and I want to hear the Samson Surfing <laughs> Salesman's <laughs> qualification methods. Oh, uh, <laughs> look, pretty rough. I think I've got a, a an Apple document and it's called yeah. my discovery template, which I duplicate every time I jump into a new discovery. And I've probably got 10 to 15 topics that I have there where I will then punch in my relevant notes. And it just helps me facilitate the conversation and know where to go. I don't follow it in any particular order, but for me, it's a list of the information that I need to get out of that initial call. Sometimes I leave a lot of it blank because the core might just not be addressing those topics sure. and you're forever discovering. But it's what I really need to understand about the clients then again, lead that sale. And just, I love so much that you've done that, that you've made a Google note that you duplicate for every discovery call. Because it's that, it's the basics and the consistency that creates an exceptional account executive. Yes, there's tools like Comptura or Dooley or Scratchpad or whatever that you can duplicate your questionnaires. And when you fill it in, it'll automatically update your CRM. Amazing that you can do that and formalize a discovery process. But all of that's more on the enablement side. You as a professional have found a consistent method that delivers results and it just takes discipline. And that's, it's remarkable. It genuinely is. I don't think you really appreciate how rare that is. I appreciate that, Ricky. Thank you. Now, 
in those questions, do you have them semi broken out into, I don't know, if you were using a sparse framework like Winning by Designs, do you have like situational questions like, hey, what's your what's the status quo or impact questions like how's this Im affecting you or pain questions like, oh, are you struggling with this or how does this process hinder you? Yes, yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm happy to read out a few of a, a few of the kind of sub, they're singular words with empty dot points below that I go in and I fill out. It starts off with next steps at the very top. <laughs> and this is, it's in no order though, right? What a classic <laughs> salesperson. I love that because the number one thing I'll listen to people's discovery calls when they're asking me for feedback and I do it all day. I get like at least one person sending me a discovery call every day saying, could I get feedback? And the first thing I do is I scroll right to the end and I just watch the last four minutes to see what the next steps were. Yeah, so next steps is important. I have things like company overview or information, their contacts, right? So this is basic information you can have in Salesforce, but you don't know who they're gonna bring on the call, you don't know the names they're gonna drop and the piece in the puzzle that they play. Talk about like current state, ideal future state, their pain or their objectives, and then I actually have a category and a a little, a little visual image of Sandler's pain funnel. So I would run them okay. through a similar pain funnel during that section. I've got things like timeline, decision process, decision maker, evaluation criteria. And then I also have underneath it a bunch of questions that I would really go into that I've heard other sales rep use that I wanna to start to bring into my daily rhythm. Mm -hmm. So creative ways of asking for budget or who the decision maker is. So I can always be learning when I'm in that discovery by utilizing new methods and hopefully just bringing myself into a rhythm of using them. Well, I could hear that there was some mixed methodology in there, but yeah. a mixture of like really good things like, like mixing like caramel, a little bit of salt and a little bit of vanilla <laughs> all worked really well. Like that Sandler pain funnel, the current states and future states, all of that. Then I definitely got a glimpse of some medic style qualifications there. And yeah, it sounds like you had phenomenal sales leader once, definitely some influence from previous Salesforce employees. <laughs> <laughs> but that is, that's all you need. I, it sounds simple, right? But if you were able to extract that information in a discovery call, you would know very clearly if your solution is able to help them and how to help them. Really good. Now, your current sales process, how many stages is it? Like cu currently, how many meetings are you having to get to a point where you're happy to commit it to the pipeline? And how many meetings until like you actually have closed one and you're no longer on that account? Yeah, look, I think, and again, this might just be the stage of where Go One is at, but I've got deals that I've been working for 12 months plus that I've had 20, 30 meetings plus with over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. Then I've got other meetings where I might have five or six meetings with different stakeholders and then it, it goes all the way through to close. Of course, within that, you have mini projects, like you've got identifying whether or not we meet their IT criteria, right? Yeah. So you're then connecting with their IT and their implementation team and to see if we're the right fit. So I almost like to think that, and you nailed it and I kind of skimmed past it, but the discovery is a sales call and everything else is delivering on the project, basically. Mm -hmm. I find that you have all that information you need. Now it's about trying to take it from the start to the finish and it's running a project ultimately. And there are hurdles and there are bumps and you can get ghosted and the project might flop and because it's not right or it's not aligned. But I find that, yeah, we, I have varying levels of times to close. It sounds r remarkably mature. And I love hearing that. And some of your projects taking 20 meetings, some of them taking four or five. That's, I identify with that a lot. You get a lot of sales leaders really trying to finesse a process down, a sales process down so much that they lose the nuance of how every project is unique. And if you empower your account executives with what they need to do, they will always do their best and not try skim. And if you try to close a 20 meeting deal on meeting number five and try to get a decision out of them, the decision is just going to be no. Pretty simple. On that incredible disqualification process, incredible sales process thereafter, where you are facilitating a buying process, it's a project, you're looking for if you meet all the criterias that you've identified during a good discovery process. Tell me, for those enterprise deals, just quickly, is your discovery always one call or is it sometimes a period of time? Yeah, I think, yeah, <laughs> so wanky, but discovery, I think, is like a fluid state. You're always going to be discovering at every single stage, all the way up until you're sending off the contract to be signed. We run our discovery, so I like to run a 30 minute discovery initially. And you get to the last couple of minutes and you feel like you've only just scratched the surface but the reason why I like it to be 30 minutes is that it's so short it's so sharp you start to gauge whether or not you are the right fit and it's worthwhile continuing the conversation it's a very minimal commitment for the prospect and you end up finishing the call and they wish they had more time with you 
So it, it's really, it's a strong next step into the next meeting, into the next stage of the process. I, I love that. I've got pictures in my head of the sitcoms where you've got the protagonist sitting in a therapist's chair and starts unpacking something and they hit on this massive epiphany and then the psychologist says uh, that's it that's all we got time for we'll see you next week but i like that in a sales process because they should want to be unpacking this they should be wanting to discover the answers how do you qualify out it's something that i'm now working on i've had a big issue of having a big fat ever-growing pipeline and I don't want to ever let anything go. And I think that most reps that have ramped have experienced that feeling. And now I'm starting to focus more on, spend more time on a smaller number of opportunities, not a smaller time on a large number of, of opportunities. So right now I'm going through Sandler training. I've never really had formal sales training. So we're going through that together at the moment. And they're very big on qualifying out. And I'm really keen to start utilizing that as part of my process. I think of keeping it really basic, a classic Sandler, no pain, no sale, where previously I may have dug and maybe I did get a couple of sales across the line when there wasn't really any pain, but hey, they were keen enough and I was managed to wing it and get the close. But I think now being able to confidently say in a call, I just don't know if we're the right fit based on what you're saying, it doesn't seem like this is a priority. And I think from saying something like that, you get a couple of different potential outcomes. You either get them saying, yeah, I agree. We're probably on the same page. Let's put the project on ice for now. Mm -hmm. Or they come back and say, no, it's because we've got, and they tell you what the real pain is. And then you can then, you lead your way from there. So I think obviously understanding if there's a pain, if there's a strong timeline and, and really openly telling them that you don't think there's the right fit and giving them an opportunity to convince you otherwise. I think you're respecting your own time. You're respecting their time and you're not just trying to, yeah, push it yeah. uphill with a stick. I appreciate that, that is a real mature sales process to take and I also get it does take time for sales professionals to get there to be willing to let go of some of that opportunity that sits in their pipeline they say actually that's noise and it's hindering my performance on these accounts that can close. Our biggest customer is a customer I try to fire. I try to fire them. They were pushing for a particular kind of outcome. And I said to them, look, it seems to me like you really want this kind of outcome. And what we're giving you is this process, which we think is the most robust process to ultimately deliver that kind of an outcome. But you want to be there right now and that's not something pointer can do for you maybe another agency will be able to do that and i think it would probably be better if you found them because you keep bringing up this particular issue and i think you'd be happier if you had that issue resolved could i make some recommendations on agencies for you to look at Amazing. And they came back saying, no, 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 we know that we can't have that right now. And there's a process to get there. And we don't want to work on this with anyone else. We want to work on it with you. Amazing. And that was the last time I had that issue with them. And they like since increased, we're doing multinational with them. But it was genuinely until I tried to fire them and call out the issue that they realized, no, they actually are choosing this. And the same goes in that discovery. Are there certain criteria that you are a bit harder on on discovering? Is it that no pain, no sale, traditional Sandler? Or is it something like if they vague on a timeline, they cut it? Yeah, if they're, look, there's no hard and fast rule. And I think like I'm very human in the way that I sell. I really want to sell based on like relationships as well and actually fixing and solving a problem. Whilst I don't have anything that's hard and fast, I guess it's, it's also a bit of a gut feel. If they come into the call and they immediately just want to talk about pricing and how you stack up against your competitors, I just, I don't know, I just feel like I'm in the back seat and I'm probably not the right fit. So what I would normally do is I'd probably just give them that information that they want. And I'm, that's almost me disqualifying, going, there's the info. You don't really want to talk to us. I'll close it off in our, in our CRM and just have an open note. Like if you want to continue the conversation, we really need a book and a time to, to connect, to understand if we are the right fit. If not, you've got the info you need and I move on about my day. I'm not rude. I'm not going to say I'm not going to work with you. But I think instances like that, I would qualify out pretty quick. Super interesting. I'd love your opinion on this. The reverse of no timeline the deals that i've never closed are the ones where they come and they're like my timeline was yesterday i need this now and i'm like all right we need to do a proper process yeah. to yeah. identify if we're the right fit if we can solve your problem etc and they're like no no, i need your price i need to know this yeah. uh, send me your contract so i can review the ndas let's go i've never closed one never i find they this is excited every time <laughs> yeah i get super excited I'm like oh my god i'm oh gonna put it in the put it in projections right put this in the forecast and then i send them the proposal i send them the the pricing and nothing ghosted almost like almost always so now like i put a discovery process in place that if they're not willing to invest 
in building up a project plan where we can clearly identify what success looks like for us to deliver on. And they might be easy come, easy go, but I don't know. Uh, do you Have you ever had those issues? And I'm genuinely asking your opinion here or for your expertise where their timing's the opposite of a don't have a timeline. Their timeline is too short for you to be able to put in a proper project plan. Yeah, I think, yeah, like I think we've all had those calls where someone is on and they're ready to close. I'm probably, I've probably done the same to other people, right? I've probably gone into JB Hi-Fi being like, yep, I'm buying this and I'm doing it today. And all of a sudden I get sidetracked and now I'm over here. And I think with that, again, it's like timeline is important, but it's more so the reason why the timeline is there. Right. If you if they said we needed this yesterday, you go. Well, what happened yesterday? And if there's something a, a significant event that you can actually correlate the timeline to, then it may be worthwhile. But if someone says we need this before the end of before Christmas, you're like, why Christmas? Oh, because people go on leave then, and we're not going to have time to implement. Like, to me, that isn't a timeline. Like yeah. to me, that's just like a random date plucked out of the future with a really bad reason why. If they say by Christmas because they have an audit come the first week of January and if they don't have this thing implemented by then, they're going to get a big fine. You start going, okay, now we're talking something a little bit more substantial. So I think the reason is you've got the timeline, but like why that date? What is the significant event about that date in particular? Super interesting. Yeah, I love that. There's got to be that critical event if you're using like a spiced model or timeline isn't something that Medic covers particularly well. Yeah. But I love that definition of just there has to be a, a strong justifiable reason and sales reps have happy ears we're always going to hear their reason and go yeah, that's a legit reason that's a good reason that makes sense to me he wanted to get his daughter a bunny for her birthday yeah. and that's on tuesday this has to be done by tuesday yeah so i get that and i'm definitely going to take that advice to heart it's like what's and what's going to happen if we don't do this by that deadline yeah of you know, course for points it's often my sdr is just quit and we need to fill the position quickly and we think we'll be quicker with an agency than hiring in-house. And I'll say, that's not a good enough reason because that reason will dissipate in six weeks from now. And if you want to be working with us in six months from now, we're going to be working together. So what's your reason for wanting to work with us other than the three week problem that we solve for you? And if I can't find that, then I'm often like, honestly, rather just go hire a freelancer of Upwork for yeah. three weeks. If you've yep. got a three, don't put a long-term solution to a short-term problem. I've picked up so much from this. And what I'm also picking up on as a subcontext here, I think GoOne's doing a phenomenal job. They're giving you sales enablement. They're giving you learning and development budgets. You're getting Sandler training. They've got best-in-class tools. Hey, this just sounds like sounds like an incredible experience. Yeah, it's been it's been a really amazing journey with GoOne. I joined in January or February of 2019, and that was just post Series B. So I joined just before the announcement. Different organization entirely. So to really see it move from a startup into a scale-up phase, where we're now developing some strong process, like it, it's been incredible incredible to witness but at the end of the day i think having these amazing tools this sales enablement that's coming into play is only as good as your own process of what you can actually implement as well i think make more with less not yeah don't just there's yeah. more tools isn't going to solve the real problem i think mm -hmm. i'm happy using my apple notes i don't think i could be sold a new note based system although i sound like i'm an ideal candidate because <laughs> as josh braun says i'm getting the job done like i don't really have a need to use wonderlist or a fantastic new um, tool, but being with GoOne has been an incredible journey. We still have a very long way to go. Our founders would say we're at the beginning, and I would also say that from a sales perspective as well. We still there's still a lot of maturity that's going to come through the organization, which I'm really excited to be part of. It's been incredible chatting to you about that, and I've really something that's crystallized in my mind through conversing with you is you can have a great company, and they can have a good process, they can have a good system, but the reason account executives are so valuable to an organization is because they are part of the team, they are part of the collective, but in, as individuals, they're also fucking exceptional. And I think you, what you are bringing to Go One as an individual, whether it's your advocacy for mental health, your professionalizing of a sales process and getting the job done in the best way, regardless of what CRM they're using, right? This is irrelevant if Go One's on Salesforce or HubSpot. Yeah. But right? your process 
is a professional process that facilitates closing good deals. And it's great to see that. And it's it's really just re refined in my mind how important it is to have talented account executives and that systems won't solve everything. Oh, you're incredibly kind, Ricky. You're making me blush. If somebody wanted to catch you online, where would they find you? And if somebody wanted to catch you out on the waves, where would they find you? Yeah, look, just straight on LinkedIn, ping me and message me on LinkedIn. I'm always, yeah, always open to a conversation, a virtual or a physical coffee and out in the water, prim primarily at the moment, Bondi or Tamrama or Bronte, the eastern suburbs of Sydney at the moment. But I am a Newcastle born, bred and raised surfer. So don't hold that against me. <laughs> All right. I wouldn't know the difference, but I am in Bondi often. So maybe I'll see you out there. Okay. But it's been really so educational for me. I'm sure our listeners have picked up a lot as well. And fantastic to see leaders like you coming through. And hopefully the sales community in Australia has many more years worth of learning from you. I appreciate future. it, Ricky. And of course, yeah, kudos to yourself as well. You share some incredible content and definitely a milestone ahead of me. Okay. We'll chat again soon. Sounds good. Take yeah. care. Bye.